Hello and welcome to Hadfield Education's Good to Great webinar series where I interview the leading head teachers in the UK and today I'm joined by Nick Bevington of Townclose School in Norwich. Um, hi Nick, how are you? Very well, thank you. Good to join you. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Um, so Nick, I always like to start by finding out sort of your route into teaching. Um, so, so what took you into, into education? Um, I'm one of those people who didn't start off as a teacher. I actually joined a finance graduate programme for British Airways. Um, and in my mind, going through school and university, I was looking for that great job and that, that great career. And I never thought of teaching. When I was a student, I did work in America for some summers, working in American summer camps. Then when I started my finance graduate programme and started thinking, is this actually what I want to do for the rest of my life? And realising that it wasn't, I came back to other things that I'd enjoyed and I realised I'd love working with young people in America. And I thought about teaching as a career, retrained, um, and then um, worked my way from being a, a classroom teacher to a head teacher. Excellent. So what was your initial route? Did you do a PGCE? Yes. Okay. And uh, within what subject? So I did a maths specialist PGC for secondary combined with a general primary. And at the time that was with Newcastle University and it was a completely new course. And because it was completely new, it was actually released later in the year. And so it was my route into teaching when actually everything else was full. And it was perfect because I wasn't sure if I wanted to be secondary or primary. And it gave me that ability to do both. Excellent, excellent. And in the early couple of years, um, who, who was sort of the biggest influencers within your teaching career? Well, I, I mean, there were many. I, I think it, my first head teacher was an influence in one key piece of advice he gave me. Um, he was trying to persuade me to um, take on a, an opportunity, but he said that in life, if an opportunity comes your way, you need to take it. And I think that's, that sounds obvious, but that's, that's really good advice. And that's, um, that's sort of how I've ended up where I am now. Um, the, the, the second person I really admired was um, some, somebody who was, as a teacher, one of the most accomplished practitioners I've ever seen, in that she was just always so good at dealing calmly with difficult situations, about getting the balance right between um, having that really warm relationship with pupils, but them knowing absolutely who was in charge. And there, were, there was no pulling the wall over her eyes or no getting one over her. And I thought that she was one of the most amazing teachers, currently a serving deputy head, but probably one of the best I've seen in my career. Excellent. And then in terms of career progression, um, move, did you move into middle leadership? Yes, I did. Um, so the opportunity that the first head wanted me to take on as a head of modern foreign languages role, and bearing in mind I'm a maths teacher, yeah. uh, you, can, you can see why we're having the conversation, but I worked in France in my gap year, um, and I had done some French as part of my degree as an extra course. Um, and they couldn't find um, a, a teacher that they wanted for the role and, and they wanted to encourage me. And so um, I actually applied for a head of department role in a subject that I wasn't a specialist teacher in. Fantastic. How did that work out? Well, uh, it worked out very well. Um, you know, in life, if you, if you don't know everything, you have to um, get the help of people who do. And I was very lucky that at the time there was a student working with us who had studied French A-level. He's now a successful author, incidentally, and is also a journalist. But at the time he was a GAP student. Um, and I went through the content for the gram French grammar lesson with him the night before to, to really get on top of this piece I was going to go through. And, I could, and the existing um, head of languages who was observing the lesson, you could tell him thinking, boy, I didn't realise that, that this young teacher knew quite so much about French grammar. Um, so I'd done my preparation properly. Fantastic, fantastic. And how long did you spend within um, middle leadership? Um, I, I spent in total only four years, which sounds like a really short time. Um, I, spent, I spent three years in that first school as head of modern foreign languages. And then I got a job as a sideways, moved to another um, modern foreign languages job to, to broaden my experience. Um, but I actually left that quite quickly because an opportunity came up um, uh, to be a, a deputy head in London. And it was for a school that was newly founded and it was a risk to take the role. Um, but I remembered about thinking about opportunities and taking them. And, and so age 31, I became a deputy head in a central London school. Fantastic. And how did that um, pan out for you? 
Um, ultimately, it was successful. It certainly led to my first headship. Um, and it was a very interesting and, and steep learning curve. Um, I was a young and still quite inexperienced teacher, really, um, leading a team of people who were mostly more experienced than, than me, um, and, and certainly many of whom had, had been in, in education a, a long time. Um, but there are certain things that are really help you in that situation. Firstly, that sense that actually you're enthusiastic, passionate, keen to support people, and basically everyone's keen to do the best they can for children, even if you differ as to how you're going to do it. And so it was, it was seeing that energy and commitment, I think, that, that um, saw me through that. But also there are times when you have to be um, tough and resilient. And there were some interesting challenges with that role. Um, being a deputy is actually one of the toughest roles in, in teaching, I think, both from a, a school organisational point of view and a day-to-day -day pupil management point of view. Absolutely. And this was made more complex by the fact that we were a multi-sited school with all the uh, safeguarding and, and, and procedural elements that go with that. Um, and, and so it was actually a really interesting and important learning experience. And in terms of um, the, the sort of the big like learns and achievements that you had within that role, um, what were they? Um, I think that more than anything, it was growing in confidence and learning that an apparently difficult situation can be dealt with. Um, and there were difficult situations in that role. I think one of the most challenging ones was newly in, when I was new in the role, the person who'd done the role previously, who'd been much loved, um, died suddenly. Um, and um, I, had to, uh, I had to break that news to pupils. Um, and we were talking about someone who all of the pupils and all of my colleagues remembered with great fondness. Um, he'd done a, a terrific job. And actually that, managing that whole uh, collective grief and mourning is a really, really difficult um, experience. Another really difficult day I can remember is, is the day of the 7-7 um, seven, seven bombings. Um, my, my school was just around the corner from Edgware Road. Oh, wow. And we were all in school that morning. Um, and there was quite a lot of, uh, you know, um, panic and um, anxiety and not knowing what was going on amongst um, both the staff who were getting news coming through and pupils who were obviously getting an idea that, that things weren't right and how best to respond to that. Um, and so, you know, I had the challenge of leading on the ground a response to a situation where mobile phones weren't working, our switchboard was going mad, people wanted to know what we were doing, that their children were safe. Wow, okay. Um, and in terms of the, the, the move to headship, yes. was that something that you, you, you'd you always planned? When, when did you sort of decide or, or feel that um, I do want to be a head teacher? Well, the funny thing is I didn't go into teaching with the idea that I wanted to be a head teacher at all. I went to teaching because I love teaching and I remember when I was in my very young teaching days of one of my colleagues when we were walking to classes and, and sort of saying aren't we lucky to be in this environment when you think about people's working environment you know how great it is it was a it was a sunny day there were pupils walking happily from place to place it was one of those idyllic moments and he said enjoy these moments you know in, in, enjoy uh, in, enjoy this time when you're at the bottom and, and I really did enjoy it. Um, and I took the opportunity in London, but even then I didn't think of myself necessarily becoming a head. Um, but I, at that, by that point I'd um, become married, uh, met, my, met my wife. We were looking at the next stage in terms of her moving out of London. I was looking at opportunities and the logical step when, when you're thinking about opportunities is well, look at the market and a headship came up, quite a big school. And I thought, well, this is a complete long shot, but I, I was a junior school attached to a senior school and I, I um, contacted the senior school head um, uh, who had offered informal meetings and, and asked for an informal meeting just to explore whether it was even worth my while going for this role. Um, and we had a conversation and it seemed from that conversation that we were really aligned as, as to where we saw education. Um, and from that, he encouraged me to apply and I went through the application process um, I actually flew back from a school trip um, to get to the second interview, so I was quite jet lagged as well. Um, but but um, you know, it, it, I, I, I got the job. Um, it wasn't an easy job, but um, that was my route into headship. Fantastic. And in terms of the the first first year, first two years within headship, 
Um, what were your big learns within that? Oh gosh, I think one of the, the first things you learn as a head is that you need to remember everybody else, but they're not going to necessarily remember you. And so you need to ask people, you know, how their family is or how was their weekend or, um, you know, is your mother feeling better or whatever it might be. Um, and think about their welfare. And yet they won't necessarily ever even contemplate your needs as a head. It's, it's a it's a different relationship and the relationship does change because people can't deal with you in quite the same way i can remember as a young teacher i was always you know one of the people in in the um staff room who was you know in enjoying light-hearted conversations and um you know being the, the center of all the fun that goes with teaching and you know you don't lose the fun as a head but you there's a certain distance and and you, you're not part of that group in quite the same way as you were before um, and I think that you also start thinking about how you're going to lead things and move things forward um, and and you 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 start seeing what you've done and what what makes a difference and you have to have quite a strong personality sometimes because inevitably all of us in not just in teaching but in general tend to be quite worried about change and doing things in different ways there's a lot of change management that is involved in headship yeah, so tell me about some of the changes that you've had to implement. Well, um, one of the, the first things I had to do is we, we had a, a school that was basically carrying more staff than it could afford. Um, and, and that's a very challenging situation because you have to work out what you're, what you're going to do in order to make sure that you, you provide for pupils in a way that's within your staff budget and at the same time try to preserve, you know, the... the the um, feeling amongst um, teaching and other staff that, you know, this is a place that we all value. So I think that was a challenge. And the other challenge I had is it was a school that hadn't previously done well in inspection, but the attitude amongst the teachers was that they were really doing a great job and that somehow the inspectors just weren't able to see what they, they were doing. And the, the, in, the inspectors were wrong effectively. Sure. And actually there were some key things that, that needed to change. Um, and, and um, you know, there, there, there were aspects of our provision which we needed to improve. And it was trying to take people on a journey to recognise that and to implement that improvement. Um, and of course, when you have done that, and then when you get a very much better appraisal next time around, or in this case, um, the time after, because my first inspection was very soon after I joined, um, I think that you, you then get people feeling quite satisfied about that and feeling quite pleased and quite validated about their contribution. But, but leading people on that journey and, and leading change is not an easy thing to do. Sure, sure. So tell me about um, current, uh, current school and, and any of the, like initiatives that you're running in, in Town Close. Well, um, we're at a very exciting time in Town Close because we've just been nominated for a, a TES National Award. Um, as, as um, we're shortlisted for being the best school in our category. And, and that is a really wonderful moment when, when staff realise that their efforts have been recognised in that way. And I think that we've been recognised for that effort because of a number of pupil-led or pupil-inspired projects, um, with, of course, the, the, the support and encouragement of, of our staff. I think the first thing that we've done is that not only with ourselves, but with many, many other schools around us and, and with hundreds of pupils um, from our local area in Norfolk. We have inspired participation in a, an environmentally friendly racing series, which combines engineering skills with teamwork, with thinking about the environment and looking at the future of zero emissions transport. Um, and there are different levels of the, this Green Power series. And we started off on what they call the Goblin level, which is for children in, in primary years. Um, and, in, and in that level, you assemble a go-kart and you take part in certain challenges like slalom, drag race and so forth. Um, and pupils drive the car and pupils are the ones who are taking other roles, like um, making sure that the driver's um, the driver change is done properly, that, that someone has to do the push start. Um, and, and so they feel like they're part of a team driving and, and running the car. Um, and uh, we actually started a, a, a a race, an event in Norfolk at an old airfield um, and lots and lots of people got involved and one of our staff uh, became an ambassador. We then moved up to the, the next formula up where you have to be a bit older and that's called F24 and now you're allowed to modify 
modify the cars and they look really much more like a racing car and less like a, a kit. And, and so pupils with adult volunteers have been working on things like the aero package, the battery management, the, the um, gearing, um, the, the uh, throttle mapping, the passive cooling, and all of those things that go to make a race car run for 90 minutes on the battery. Um, we started a, an event with Lotus here in Norfolk and, and we had the first race at Lotus. We qualified for the international finals, which were at Silverstone. And in our first year, we were the um, best international newcomer. And this year, we actually came third in the international finals in the world. So there were over 100 cars. Out. And we were third in the world. We were the youngest team there. But our students were a bit lighter, so that does help. Being younger, they're a bit smaller. Um, <laughs> That's so fantastic. that's one of, one of the things we've done. Um, we introduced with our school council a new uniform policy, which basically stripped gender labels out of uniform and allowed children um, to wear the version of the uniform that they felt comfortable with. Um, and that's in some ways was a very small change because we'd always allowed in our policies boys in quotation marks to, to wear their girls uniform and vice versa. But now all pupils can choose between the skirt stroke dress uniform and the short stroke trouser uniform. Brilliant. What's happened is that firstly, we wrote to parents and although the local press picked it up, no parents worried about it. And secondly, we introduced it. A handful of pupils have come in the version of the uniform that they didn't previously wear. Not a particularly large number, but it's very natural and easy and it was a, an obvious change and it, it just shows that we are listening to our pupils and to adapting to the way that society is moving. Um, the third thing we've done is we work really hard to reduce plastic consumption and um, we use, there were lots of single use items that we used to have. But our new school council chair elected by our pupils um, using alternative votes, so you know the most democratic um, voting system that we could find. Um, she is determined that we are going to go further. And I like the fact that she feels that we can lead. And we've also been working on homework policy and with the school council, we changed um, the homework policy. In theory, we're giving the children the same amount that they always had. But in practice, they're getting longer periods to um, concentrate on things and do them in more depth. So rather than having two homeworks a night, they're having one homework a night and they're, they're having that homework every other week, which, and the homework is in theory lasting double the time, which allows them to take their time and not feel on that endless treadmill. Pressure. The last thing we've done is we've, we've worked with teachers on feedback. And again, uh, the school council was key to this. And we've been experimenting in different ways of uh, what traditionally you call marking. It's actually better, better called feedback because it doesn't have to be on the page. And we've really managed to develop a policy which gives teachers much more professional autonomy and gives them much more time to plan their lessons, whilst I think giving better feedback to pupils. So that's really had a positive effect on workload. Sounds fantastic. And some real um, like forefronted um, policies and changes and, you know, and as well, student led, which if you empower people to, to make decisions, you're always going to get 100% more buy-in, aren't you? Absolutely. And I think that people often worry that children will make silly or naive decisions if, if you ask them. And in actual fact, that can be true if they're not used to taking responsibility. But the more that they're used to being involved and taking decisions, the more you find that you tend to make very sensible decisions. Yeah. Um, and I think that we need, in general, a society to have more faith in our young. Um, their views are often dismissed as being naive, and they yeah. would think that because they don't know about the world. But often those fresh eyes actually see things which our own experience and prejudice has stopped us from seeing. Yeah. And whereas I think that young children and older students do need, of course, to listen to adults and to respect adults' views, I think adults need to think a bit more about young people's views and why they think that. 100%. I, th I think as well, with the way in which um, children nowadays are open to so much in terms of social media and the, the internet, um, the way in which they may percep like perceive something could be incredibly like, thoughtful and, and, and really good insight, as opposed mm. to, like you say, we may, might not necessarily have that. Um, and we, mm. we, we may have already had those, those pre-built barriers, but... It sounds, yeah. sounds absolutely brilliant. The brilliant mm. work that you're doing. 
Um, and in terms of, of, of moving forward, do you have any other initiatives that, that you've got sort of your, your eyes set on? Well, our, our next goal, um, which has been articulated by a new um, school council chair, is all about taking our environmental awareness further and acting further. And I think if you talk to young people, what is their concern above all else? And as much as the, the country may be talking lots about Brexit and, and young people are definitely a Remain majority, sure. actually, their biggest concern is about the environment, about the future. Um, and there's that feeling that the, the current generation has known about the issues we now face for quite a while. You know, to my shame, I, I studied global warming at university in the early 90s. Um, and somehow our generation has put that out of our minds in the way that we've acted. Um, other, other things like economic growth um, and, and other imperatives have allowed us to, not to think about it clearly enough. And yet the, the evidence of the rapidity of change and, and the starkness of what we're facing has, has grown ever stronger. And I think that the current generation is, is determined that we need to be more ambitious than 2050 in terms of our, our, our carbon neutral targets and wants to look at all possible ways of eliminating single-use plastic, um, eliminating the use of fossil fuels where possible, leaving things in the ground. And actually, it starts with what every single person can do. Um, and and uh, Greta Thunberg has also been a big inspiration to um, young people. And actually, we, uh, um, we as a staff, uh, have um, we, we led an assembly specifically charting um, what she has done and, and her work. Because in her, you also have a lesson that uh, as a young person, you can make a difference. And she would never have thought this time last year that she would be um, such a globally recognised name yeah. in just 12 months' time. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and within, within school, um, what do you feel um, has, uh, has enabled or, or what do you feel makes a really solid, really strong um, senior leadership team? I think that you have got to really think about any team being built upon relationships. And those relationships, those professional relationships, are the key to, to achieving um, great things together. And I think that, that it's not just relationships with the senior team, it's relationships with the staff, the staff's relationships with pupils, and everyone's relationships with parents. I think it's recognising that you are all pulling in the same direction in terms of, you know, we, we, we're all here because we, we want young people to achieve their best. Uh, and I, I, I don't think that there's anyone in teaching who doesn't believe that. And, and actually, if, if, you're not, if you're not there for that reason, that really is the, you know, one of the key, the key um, signs that actually it's the wrong job for you. Yeah. But, but I think that everyone's in that position. So it's, it's about trying to listen to people's views about trying to have that spirit of cooperation and understanding and collectively finding a way forward that will work and will um, get the, the buy-in. And the more you can involve people in decision-making, the, the more likely you are to, to make those decisions a success. And the biggest driver of staff happiness is that sense of autonomy. I can make a difference. And I think where you have morale issues, it tends to be when you're feeling that actually um, what I do isn't really appreciated and, and the way I think things should change isn't really being listened to. Um, there are times where people have to do things that they'd rather not, and there are times where difficult messages have to be given. But I think that if you can maximise the positive relationships with people and maximise their input, then, then you're going to give yourself the best chance to achieve collectively. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what advice would you give to any um, sort of student teachers um, or NQTs, you know, entering in first year of profession? Okay, well, the, I've, I've seen quite a few MQTs in terms of, uh, of my own um, observations, lesson observations, and also I, I've um, done some uh, interviewing for Brighton University. And what I would say is that the calibre of people going into teaching these days, I, I, I think is more impressive than ever. And the, the quality of some of the work that I've seen young teachers achieve is, is again, really quite encouraging for the future. But I think there are challenges too. And I think that it's, um, uh, the advice for teaching would be rather like the advice for acting. It, it's definitely not an easy path. Um, and it's a sort of job that you only do if you can't think of doing anything else. 
because the people who really want to be teachers just aren't prepared to think about any other possibility because that's what they want. So almost if you're in doubt about being a teacher, it's probably not the right job. You've, you've got to know that you want it. And I think all of us teachers have that point where we suddenly realise that that's, that's what we did want. So I, th I think that's the, the first thing I would say. I think the, the second thing I would say is that it is a, a tough profession. And when you look at what you are theoretically supposed to do, actually, it seems pretty impossible. And I think you've got to be quite smart with your time and quite smart at realising what's important and what isn't important. Um, and, and try to make sure that you, you focus on those things that really are important. And I think when you're developing your craft with students and when you're in front of a, a class or dealing with interactions, there are always going to be challenges. And I think that you definitely improve in terms of your assuredness and your ability to take control. Um, I think that the key advice for a new teacher is to um, play things with a straight bat, not, 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 try to, not try to be funny, not court popularity, um, but, but to be very straight with people, very, very fair, and always to focus on the choices that students have, rather than to ever get into a confrontation. So rather than the, you will do this, no, I won't. Very much that this is the situation, you know, the, these are your choices, these are the consequences of the choices, you know, it, it is down to you. Um, and because ultimately, that, that is the way it is. And it's, it's having that assuredness, um, not, not to be um, riled or, or, or to be um, provoked or be, to be flustered by a situation that's difficult. Um, and, you know, that can arise anywhere. But of course, when you're dealing with young people, you, you're, you're dealing with a group of people who are, um, you know, energetic, but they're, they're, they're keen, they're enthusiastic, but they're also finding their place in the world. And they certainly don't suffer fools gladly. No, absolutely, absolutely. And what about um, senior leaders that are thinking about headship and, and their progression into headship? What advice would you give to those? Um, I think that people who are the best heads sometimes dismiss themselves as being heads because they somehow don't think they could do it. And, and actually, um, I would like all of those people who, who are thinking that they might like to be a head but don't quite believe that it would be right or worry that they wouldn't be able to take the pressure or um, think that, that somehow there'll be somebody else that's better than them. I, I'd say go for it. Um, and, and actually, um, in, in most professions, we, most of us tend to think of others around us somehow knowing more or, or being more capable. There's an inherent insecurity about the, the human nature. But my view is that actually I've seen so many um, teachers and senior leaders who, who could make great heads. Um, and, and I think that most of the rules that apply to teaching and most of the rules that apply to senior leadership are really the same rules that apply to headship. And, and, and headship's a, a, a role that in some ways frees you from certain day-to-day -day responsibilities, but actually gives you, um, a, you know, a, a different set of, of very interesting uh, relationships and, and very interactions um, and I think it's a really uh, rewarding um, role and that there's nothing more satisfying than um, you know, standing in, up in front of a whole school and, 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 and leading it so Absolutely. you can do it brilliant and in terms of outside of work um, what, what, what takes you, your, your mind off of, uh, off of the stresses and strains of the day job well, um, having a family um, certainly uh, takes your mind. So it, it can be a busman's holiday at times when you're a teacher and you have a family. Um, uh, yeah, I play tennis. I play tennis for, for a team, um, yeah, a local team in Norfolk. Um, I wouldn't say it's that elite team. Nevertheless, you know, just competing in sport is fun, um, at whatever level you are. Um, I, I love uh, singing, um, and I'd say anything that involves joining a choir. Um, getting involved in a local community group, um, just getting involved in the community, interacting with people who are doing different things from teaching. And then your family and friends and, and uh, uh, walks and activities and just keeping a balance to life. I think any teacher or any head teacher has to know when they've, they've worked as many hours as they can work in a day. And, and actually, you, you need to know when to stop and when to, to, to carry on with your life, because otherwise you won't make a great teacher and you certainly won't be able to sustain um, you know, in the long term. No, agreed. I think that's something...
from my experience of, of dealing with teachers that, that uh, there's a, a specific niche that really, they really struggle with that because let's be honest, a, a teaching, you know, a teacher's job is, is never complete. There's always going to be more that you can do. And it's yeah. the same in, in other kind of roles and, and environments, but there must be, um, a, a, you know, a time where they draw a line and say, no, I am satisfied. I'm, I have done everything that I can do. And then, you know, have a, a bit of a bit of R and R or, or um, you know, a, a switch off. Um, but I do, I do genuinely think there's, there's a, a, a proportion of, of the teacher population who, who do struggle with that, you know, incredibly conscientious, worry yeah. a lot, um, but only because they want to do the best possible job that they can. Um, yeah. Fantastic. So okay. Email at night is, 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 a, is a good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the email, is yeah is something that people really struggle to get away from um mm. and what about in terms of book what's what's the last book that you've read well I, i'm now um uh, reading a book um by roy blatchford called restless school which is very interesting um because it's all about thinking moving forwards and, and and thinking about the future um but in between that i also um uh, went to a talk last week by um uh, an internet um, blogger and a, a creativity inspirer called Nick Corston. Um, and uh, I, I had a book from his talk, which I um, read over the weekend. Um, and that's all about this unlocking this sense of creativity in a world where we are ever focusing on the um, narrow measurables of education. Um, it, it's all about thinking about the things that really drive success. And um, he, he has Einstein's great quote in it, which is, um, that logic can get you from A to B, but imagination can take you anywhere. Um, it's all about trying to, to think beyond the measurable. Excellent, excellent. And in terms of work, um, what's your favourite um, app that you use? Oh, gosh. Um, I, I, that, that is an interesting question because I, I, um, I use lots of apps and we've got um, different um, mind mapping apps um, and we, we've got a um, great app for teaching called Explain Everything. Even um, I love using in the classroom um, uh, the random um, selector apps so that, so that take out any um, uh, human bias. Um, uh, I, I'm quite into my um, uh, music apps, of course, um, for, for my own leisure time. Um, and I consume all my um, news on, on, on various um, sort of, uh, free and subscription um, news apps. And then I think virtually everything that you do in your everyday life these days is on an app. We even have, um, of course, our great Town Close online presence. And you can even um, sort out most things for Town Close on your smartphone. So um, it's, it's difficult to, to say a favourite, but I, I, I think a good, a good thing to do sometimes, just like it's good to go to the supermarket and buy five things that you've never bought before. I think sometimes it's good to go onto the app store and just go and download an app that you you didn't think you need and um you know it's, it's it's interesting just to always have that spirit of trying something new i remember that i did that for a while where um you could get the editor's choice and mm. you would then you would just discover a new app that you'd never heard of didn't have really mm. any use for but because it was applicable to something that you needed it was, a really, it was a really good way of, of finding new and, and up and coming apps as well. There's, some brilliant, there's some brilliant apps now for teaching. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I really like the ones like Socrative where you get that interaction between pupils and teachers. And, and um, the virtual learning environment we, we use is also brilliant for being able to um, uh, have uh, comments that are viewable by everyone. And it really um, helps discourse. So, so I, I think that, you know, education is, is lots of exciting, um, exciting stuff in education. Definitely, definitely. And what about favourite holiday destination? Where, where do you like to get away to? Oh, my goodness. That, that's also a difficult one because there, there's something. Uh, um, if you think about a holiday, um, one of the best moments of a holiday is, is when you dive into clear water. Um, and it's almost as you go underwater and you, you swim in, in, in the, the cool water with, with all of those um, lovely um, shards of light caused by the ripples on the water. It's almost like every worry that you have sort of fades away and, and you're sort of temporarily submerged in paradise. And I, you know, especially like you know, somewhere like the coast of Croatia where 
you have many rocks where you can just dive straight into the deep sea um, and it's so beautifully um, clear and I love, I'm not a particularly good swimmer, but I, I love swimming in the sea and, and um, that freedom that it gives you that's so different from swimming in a swimming pool. Um, so, um, but I mean, I love skiing as well, where, where you're on, on, on a mountain and it's just you in the snow. Um, um, I think sunshine is, is um, an important ingredient for any holiday because it, it gives you that, that lift of optimism. Fantastic. I've heard really, really good things about Croatia. Really good things. Yeah. Um, it's on my, it's on my list of, of destinations. And yeah, in terms you get a sailing boat um, and, and, and uh, uh, anchor in a small harbour, um, uh, you know, dive off and, and swim ashore. Um, you know, they're, 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 it's certainly a, a you know, very beautiful sort of Mediterranean of old type of feel to it. Lovely. And in terms of if you hadn't become a teacher, where do you think your you would have your, your journey would have taken you oh that's so difficult isn't it because in a way um lots of teachers find it hard now to imagine doing anything else but i would like to do something that involved you know presenting things or animating things or um some sort of um communication type role um and, and very much on the the human side and I do enjoy thinking about things and, and coming up with ideas and discussing ideas. So I, I think the, the other thing might, might be the, the, um, I, the turning an idea into a business reality. So I quite often think of something that might make a good product. And of course, as a teacher, I, I, I never develop it, but um, I quite like ideas. Excellent. And who's been the biggest influence overall in your, in your career to date? Oh wow! Now that that is that's a very difficult question. I um, there was one conference that I went to on brain science, where um, uh, a speaker and and he can't be that big an influence because I can't remember his name, but he came out with a statistic that's been an influence, which was um, his research showed that ninety eight percent of what we know we've taught ourselves, and two percent of what we know we've been taught, um, and I remember that thinking, well, of course. Uh, whether that's true or not, even if it's um, out, you know, by a factor of five, and it's actually 10% of what, what we know, um, that really does make you think about the role of a teacher in a slightly different way. It may perhaps makes you obsess a bit less about what curriculum you're covering, and, and that's a bit more about the, the human skills that you're um, developing. Um, but I, I think there are other um, great influences that, that I've um, loved. Um, I think um, Stephen Fry is someone who I've I've found inspiring um, and I think I found him inspiring because of firstly of his his genius in certain respects but how that's combined with vulnerability and, and his openness to um, discuss and his writing about you know his, his emotions and his journey and, and their highs and lows and I really ad admire that um, but but I've not actually met him as a person and, and there, there are a few professional sports people that I've, I've come to know um, through teaching and I, I tell you what I really admire about them is people often fantasize about being a professional sports person and think how wonderful it would be and it's amazing just how hard they work how determined they are um, and you know you don't get to those positions by accident but no. um, I, I couldn't I couldn't give you a single name who has turned my life around but I think I've been influenced by quite a few people good Good. Excellent. OK, well, thank you ever so much for your time today and your insight. It's been fascinating and incredibly informative. I really appreciate it. What's You're the best welcome. way for people to get in, in contact with you? Well, um, my email's in the public domain, head at townclose.com. And on Twitter, I'm, I'm at townclosehead. So um, those are both pretty easy ways to, to get in touch. Brilliant. Well, what I'll do, um, I'll put the, the links into the, the role below. Uh, and also there'll be a, a couple of pop-ups as well that all, people can click and, and connect with you on. Um, and once again, thank you ever so much for your time. It's been really, really good and informative. It's a pleasure to speak to you too. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.